Wise About Texas. Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and I want to thank you for tuning in for a little bit of Texas history today. This podcast episode is being released in early September 2018, so I hope everybody had a good summer. Got the kids back in school, the routine's back going. Thank goodness it's football season in Texas, sacred time this fall, and we're headed toward hunting season. We've got dove season going on, and I uh, hope everybody's getting out and enjoying some of the outdoors. I've heard from a lot of lo- new listeners over the last couple of weeks, and I want everyone to keep spreading the word. It's always fun to hear about somebody, how they discovered the podcast, and uh, hope everybody's enjoying it. I've had a couple of people talk about binge listening to all the episodes, which uh, takes a while now. We've had enough of them. This is episode 58, and uh, you're joining over 250,000 people who have downloaded this podcast. So thanks very much. Be sure and put it on your social media. And the preservation and promotion of Texas history only works if we spread the word. Well, as you may know, this year marks the 300th anniversary of the founding of the city of San Antonio, Texas. What a great place. In fact, um, this episode is being released on a Monday. I'm going to be heading to San Antonio later this week for the Texas General Land Office's Save Texas History Symposium. So uh, if anybody listening to this episode is attending the Save Texas History Symposium, be sure and introduce yourself, email me, let's get together. Um, Today we're going to talk about San Antonio, and we're going to talk about a very interesting story in a ceremony that probably has happened only one place in North America, and that's the city of San Antonio. What kind of ceremony was it? Well, it was a peace ceremony. In 1749, the Apache Indians and the Spanish citizens of San Antonio buried the hatchet literally. So let's go back to 1749 and get wise about Texas. Before we get to the ceremony, we're going to have to set the scene and give you a little background. And we're going to start with the Spanish missions. Now, the Spanish missions in San Antonio are probably familiar to most folks that are listening to this podcast. But the Spanish mission system was not just in San Antonio, they were all over Texas. They founded some missions in East Texas, almost to the, what is now the Louisiana border. Uh, They had set up missions on the San Saba River, the Nueces River. Uh, There were missions near the Rio Grande, but the most famous ones are the ones in San Antonio. And the five we remember, and you can go visit today, are San Antonio de Valero. Now, you're going to have to forgive my Spanish. I always tip my Spanish pronunciation is not good. I'm just going to say that. And I'm not even I'm not going to insult everyone by trying to uh, sound like a native Spanish speaker. Um, so here are the five missions that we talk about the most. Uh, San Antonio de Valero, which is known as the Alamo. San Jose y San Miguel de Guayo. Nuestra Señora de la Purisma Concepción, or we call it Mission Concepción today. San Juan Capistrano and San Francisco de Espada. Now, these are all in the upper San Antonio River region, and as I mentioned, you can go visit those today, and it's really a great way to spend a day visiting the, the missions. Well, the missions needed protection uh, because, remember, what the, what the uh, Spanish were trying to do, what the civil government was trying to do was occupy the far-flung province of Texas because they were feeling the pressure of the French to the east. Uh, what the Franciscan friars that participated in this project were trying to do was convert the Indians. Either way, it required these missions to be established way away from any supplies or protection. So what the Spanish would do was build a fort, or it's called a presidio, and they would station some soldiers in conjunction with the mission. Presidio, San Antonio de Bejar, was placed on the west side of the San Antonio River across from the Alamo. And at one point, it had about 54 soldiers. Um, those those numbers would fluctuate, of course. Uh, that's not a whole lot, if you think about it. Um, the, the Presidio itself would be an adobe building, and then the soldiers would live outside the Presidio in grass huts. Now, it wasn't just the soldiers that were there. There were um, support personnel, and the soldiers' families would live with them, so everybody moved up to the area around the Presidio. Well, uh, I mentioned that the soldiers and the priests were the two components to this mission system, and they didn't always get along. 
Uh, the soldiers were there uh, to protect the missions and to follow the orders of the government. The priests were there to convert the Indians, which they were convinced that they could do. Uh, the Franciscans were particularly zealous in their desire to convert uh, the Indians, uh, but not so zealous that they rejected the presence of the soldiers. But the entire system was uh, hoped by the central government to protect Spanish territory against French Louisiana. In 1718, in addition to San Antonio, we had the founding of New Orleans. Um, so things were coming together in North America. Now, we need to talk about uh, the Indians in the area. We talk a lot about the Texas Revolution, the period after the Texas Revolution, and we, when we discuss Indians in Texas, we usually discuss the Comanche. But in the 1700s, it was the Apache that were the issue for the Spanish. Now, the Indian tribe that we refer to as the Apache are really part of the southern part of a family of indigenous people called the Athapascan. Now, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but that's how I'm pronouncing it. Um, the Apache are the uh, half of the southern part of that family of indigenous people. The other half are the Navajo. Now, the eastern Apaches, and that was a Spanish designation, they, they called uh, the various members of the Apache tribe, they called them the eastern Apache or the western Apache. The eastern Apaches in Texas were the Lipans, the Natizes, I don't know if that's correct or not, and the Mescalero. Uh, the Lipans were the most prevalent in Texas at the time of the Spanish missions. Now, uh, having butchered all of these names, I'm going to refer to them generally as Apaches. We're not going to try to differentiate between the bands because it's not important to the story. When the Spanish missionaries showed up, uh, the Apaches lived in the upper parts of the Colorado River, the Brazos River, and the Red River, but the Comanches started to push them down toward the San Saba, the Paternalis, the Atlanta River. Um, they also populated the areas around the Pecos River and the Rio Grande, so they covered a, a large segment of Texas. Uh, the Spanish were not unfamiliar with the Apaches. They'd actually been fighting with them in New Mexico since the late 1600s, and they, if you read the Spanish descriptions of the Apaches, they're described as very warlike, uh, very adept fighters, uh, not unlike the Comanches were later described. Well, as soon as the Apaches found out that San Antonio had been established, the raids began. And uh, at one point, the Spanish tried to convince them that it would be better to make peace. The Apache response to that was shooting a bunch of arrows in the ground near San Antonio and hanging red cloth on them, sending a fairly clear message that was not going to happen. Uh, there was a constant problem with theft of stock. Anyone uh, operating outside of the town for any reason could not go out alone. Raiding was a constant problem. In the spring of 1722, a new captain arrived for the Presidio of San Antonio named Flores. And after he took over, uh, things were fairly quiet. In fact, there were no raids from the spring of 1722 all the way until August 1723. And then the Apaches decided they were going to get back after the horses. Well, let me tell you how good they were. There was one corral in, in summer of or late summer, early fall of 1723. There was a corral full of horses. The gate was locked, and Flores had posted 10 soldiers to guard the corral. Well, overnight, the Indians got past the 10 soldiers through the locked gate and stole 80 horses. Now, eight, moving 80 horses is a heck of an enterprise in the middle of the day much less sneaking them out at night. So those Apaches were really good when they put their minds to it. Well, Flores wasn't going to have that. In that particular raid, he grabbed 30 soldiers and 30 Mission Indians as trackers. These Mission Indians were primarily Coahuiltecans. Um, there were a few other tribes that uh, converted and decided to try to live in the missions. And many, many of those Mission Indians were simply seeking protection from the Apaches. But they got Flores rounded 30 of the Mission Indians up so that they could help track these Apaches. And this Flores campaign traveled over 200 miles until he finally found the Apaches. And what he found was over 200 of them. Well, he engaged them immediately. It was a six-hour battle. 
They killed, uh, Flores and his men killed 34 Indians, including the chief. They captured 20 women and children and took them back to San Antonio. They also got 120 horses, uh, tons of stolen property, property that had been stolen from San Antonio area, saddles, bridles, knives, tools, that kind of thing. And if you do the math and look at the, um, the accounts of the time, uh, it seems that this battle was more north of San Antonio rather than northwest, so it was more maybe in the Brownwood area. Uh, we don't know for sure, but um, the Spanish accounts talk about traveling in leagues, which is uh, between two and three miles. And so if you start counting those up, um, they might have made it all the way to Brownwood. Anyway, um, Flores, you would think, would be regarded among the people of San Antonio as a hero. But I mentioned earlier there was a little bit of tension sometimes between the soldiers and the priests. And so one of the priests, the priest of the Alamo, it was not called the Alamo at the time, Mission San Antonio de Valero, he argued that Flores had basically attacked defenseless Indians uh, rather than uh, led a campaign against raiders, despite the fact that he had brought back a bunch of horses and other stolen property. Anyway, that tension continued. Now, one of the things that the uh, Spanish were wondering about at the time is why these Apaches were so hostile. Here the Spanish were offering them an opportunity to live what the Spanish considered a civilized life. Uh, And if you look at it from the Indian perspective, it would have been a living hell to be restrained uh, for Indians like the Apaches anyway. Uh, But in any event, the Spanish thought, well, why in the world wouldn't you want to uh, live like we're showing you to live, and why are you so hostile to our presence? Well, one of the captives that Flores brought back uh, spoke Spanish and described the problem. And what the problem for the Apaches, was, at least for this group, was they were concerned about their relationship with what they described as, quote-unquote, other Spaniards to the north. Well, who they meant was the French. The French were trading with the Comanches. The French were foraying into East Texas, Spanish East Texas. Um, We'll save for another episode the Battle of the Twin Villages up on the Red River. But there was a significant amount of French trading activity with uh, the Indians in the north, and that's what that captive was talking about. And, of course, the Spanish knew that. So they immediately started trying to find a way to make peace with the Apaches and therefore make them their allies. Um, Well, about 1723, the same time period, there were some peace efforts, and word came back from five chiefs. I should mention at this point the Apaches, the Spanish thought, and they were largely correct, had split into five bands, the Texas area Apaches. I'm going to say Texas area just for um, an easy way to visualize it. The, The Apaches that San Antonio was dealing with were split into five bands, and the five chiefs said, uh, that they would make peace. Now, how they found this out was they Flores sent one of the captives out to the tribe to uh, convey this message. Well, it turns out, at least according to, uh, to accounts later, that the woman that Flores had sent out to the tribes got there just in time because the tribes were mounting a massive attack on San Antonio to try to recover the women and children. Uh, but what once the messenger arrived, the Indians said, hey, why don't we hold off on this attack? Let's talk to these Spanish about their peace proposal, and maybe that's a way to get the women and children out first, and then we will attack them. Um, that sort of scenario would repeat later in 1840 with the Comanche. Um, but anyway, they got into an argument with Flores about which would come first. Would you release the women and children to the Indians as a show of good faith, which, of course, the Indians desired? Uh, Flores said, no way. You come in here and make peace, and then you can return home with your women and children. So those peace negotiations never really got past that standoff. Um, The Apaches continued to raid a little bit. Uh, The Spanish were trying to keep things calm. They were trying to move toward peace. The Apaches were attacking primarily Mission Indians, um, but still doing some raiding. In about late 1723, um, different accounts say maybe 1724, not exactly sure, but we do know there was a nine-day battle 
between the Comanches and the Apaches that resulted in a Comanche victory and resulted in the Apaches being pushed further south, closer to San Antonio. Now, this would not be good news for the Spanish to have the Apache range compressed and move closer to San Antonio. It would be good news eventually uh, because the Comanche threat convinced the Apache to take a different tack. But in any event, after this battle, the Apaches were fairly inactive in the late 1720s. Uh, They were so inactive that representatives of the Spanish government on tours of Texas recommended reducing the number of um, soldiers, etc. But in 1731, it started over again. There was a priest attacked on his way to the Rio Grande. Uh, The uh, Apaches entered the Alamo and stole 50 donkeys. So think about that. Um, That was a Spanish mission, a center of commerce, a center of activity, a center of agriculture. Um, And the Apaches managed to enter the actual mission and make off with 50 animals. Uh, They went to another mission. They stole every single horse. In September of 1731, they attacked the horse herd at the actual Presidio where the soldiers were headquartered. Uh, There was a new commander by this time. His name was Almazan. He went after him, uh, just as Flores had done, and he later ran into what he described as 500 Indians. Uh, So the numbers were getting bigger. In other words, the range, it wasn't that the number of Apaches was increasing. It was that their range was being compressed by the Comanches. Um, the Apaches had them whipped in that particular fight with Almazan, by the way, and they had reduced the number of Spanish to very few. The Spanish had actually dismounted in an attempt to sort of every man for himself save their lives. And then all of a sudden, the Apaches took off. Um, and that was not unusual. Um, they would sort of, the way I read the accounts, it's sort of in a decision on the part of the Indians that they had been there long enough reinforcements might be coming. Uh, They weren't, but the Indians didn't know that, and they wanted to get out of there. The reason that it lasted so long to begin with was that the Spanish had guns and the Apaches did not. So they, uh, Almazan and some of his soldiers, managed to save themselves. After this, they decided to launch launch a uh, larger campaign, um, and they knew the Apaches had been pushed south by the Comanches. So in 1732, they went out on another campaign against the Apaches. This one was very successful. Um, and after that, the Apaches made a few peace overtures. Spanish still uh, had the desire to have peaceful relations with them and protect against the Comanche, which they were starting to learn a little more about at this time. So they decided to uh, accept the Apache offer of peace. Three soldiers were going to escort a couple of Apache warriors and a squaw back to the tribe to talk about peace. And uh, the warriors led the soldiers right into an ambush of about 24 braves. Now, there, there was the third soldier, luckily, had lagged behind the main group and saw his two compadres fall and be surrounded by the warriors. Uh, later, when they went out and got the bodies, they discovered that uh, the the uh, soldiers' bodies had been mutilated and uh, the flesh taken off the bones, which is how the Apaches sent the rather convincing message uh, to the Spanish that this was not going to work. So San Antonio was thrown into a panic because it turns out maybe the Apaches didn't want peace, as they had said. So we were back to the um, existence of raiding and campaigning, Um, And then, all of a sudden, the Apaches became much more interested in Christianity. So what in the world could have been going on? Um, In 1743, one priest learned of a fight between the Comanche and Apache. The Comanches had come down. They had attacked a a superior Apache force. Uh, They lost the battle. Uh, The Comanche, or the Apache killed... All but one Comanche uh, left him alive to go tell the tale to his tribe, which was not unusual. Um, the Apaches, in the relaying the account to the priest, uh, 
and, and they would get this news, by the way. It doesn't make sense. Priests didn't wander out among the Apaches and chat them up. Um, the captives and the traders, there was still some trading. There was raiding going on, but there would also be trading. And so uh, news would come uh, from the Apaches to the Spanish. And so uh, this this one particularly astute priest uh, heard about this battle. He heard that they had sent one Comanche away, but he also heard that uh, the Apache had noticed that none of the Comanche warriors ever surrendered, nor did they flee, despite knowing that they were going to die. Um, the priest, uh, the Apaches also told this priest, well, after this big battle, um, the Comanche, the Apaches were so fearsome that the Comanche would surely avoid them in the future. How wrong they were. The same priest that learned all this wrote a letter to the Viceroy of Mexico, and he suggested, you know, I think this is time for us to move some missions out into the Apache territory that he thought the Apaches might be a little more willing to convert at this point. So we still had raiding. We still had trading. We still had campaigns to chastise the raiders. Uh, we had Apache and Comanche fighting. Um, and then we had this priest thinking, well, here's the time to go out into the Apache territory. What the priest was speculating, and, and he turned out to be right, was that there were fewer Apaches than everybody thought. And uh, he also realized that the Comanches were going to pose a problem for the Spanish and uh, how right he turned out to be. Um, but there were some other advantages to a Presidio in the Apache territory. Number one, it would keep the Apaches, uh, I said Presidio, I meant Mission and Presidio. It would keep the Apaches away from San Antonio and the Franciscans, he thought would be able to work their magic and convert uh, the Apaches who had been so reticent to do so. From the Crown's perspective, though, um, this also might seem like a good idea because the Spanish reach in Texas could be extended. We still had the French problem to deal with, uh, and there were minerals and rumors of minerals all over the Apache territory that the Crown could exploit. But that left unanswered why the Apache all of a sudden would be interested in all of this and converting to Christianity. And that comes down to one word, Comanche. Now, before this plan could come together, there was one more campaign in early 1749 that captured three old women and five children from the Apache. Another outing right after that captured several dozen more, including some warriors. So now the Apaches were weakened in the Spanish view, and now was the time to try to finally make that peace. So Captain Jose Urrutia, who was now commander of the Presidio in San Antonio, sent two women and a captured brave to go tell the Apache chiefs that he would release all the prisoners in exchange for peace. We've heard that before. They left in April, and they promised to return in three moons, or three months. They returned in August with news that not only was the peace proposal accepted by the Apaches, but four chiefs were already camped on the Guadalupe River, and they were awaiting the word from Urrutia to enter San Antonio and make the peace formal. Urrutia told them, you can come into San Antonio whenever you're ready, all I ask is that you send up a smoke signal so that we could prepare the appropriate ceremony for you. And finally, on the night of August 15th, 1749, smoke could be seen on the horizon outside of San Antonio. Now, in the meantime, Uridia had constructed a special building just for this peace ceremony. And uh, Uridia led all the troops from the Presidio. He led all the priests from the mission and most, if not all, of the citizens of San Antonio out to meet the Indians. So they went outside of town a couple of miles. Uh, they met the Indians, and they brought them in to San Antonio. And we're not sure who was happier about this celebration, uh, but accounts uh, say that the Apache chiefs were very joyful. They hugged the captain. They hugged all the priests. Uh, there were lots of ceremony and, and greeting and after that, they returned to the building, this reception hall that Urudia had built for the purpose, and they had this huge feast. 
Um, they served everything they could serve. There was beef, there was corn, there was fruit. Um, the chiefs were actually separated and given uh, first-class lodging in the Presidio and the missions. Um, and they were, uh, the accounts I read said they were entertained. Um, so, you know, they were clearly treated with not only respect, but just sort of uh, fawning over to make this the big deal that it no doubt was to the Spanish. Um, they held a mass the following day, which all the Indians attended. Uh, the whole, all of San Antonio attended. So uh, on the 18th of August, they released, uh, the Spanish released all the prisoners. So the Indians had come to San Antonio. They'd had all this uh, joyful, good time. And the Spanish went first and released all the prisoners. A ceremony was planned for the following day, August 19th. Now, this would have been a huge deal in the life of San Antonio because thinking about it, anybody that had been there, this is 1749, so if you had been there for 30 years, um, all you would have known was the danger of the Apache depredations. So everybody in San Antonio thought this was it. We're finally going to have peace. This was going to take place on what we now call the main plaza, and it filled up early in the morning of the 19th. So on one side, you had the soldiers and the priests and the citizens of San Antonio, and on the other side of the plaza, you had the chiefs and, and all the Indians, uh, in addition, the released captives that they had just given back. And what they did was they dug a hole in the center of the plaza, and the hole uh it was described as a, a large hole in the, uh, or a great hole. And um, there's an account by a man named Cabello who uh, talks about a large hole being dug. And they proceeded to lay some objects in the hole. They laid a hatchet, and probably more than one. They laid a lance, again, probably more than one. And uh, Cabello talks about six arrows. Um, other accounts say bows and arrows. But basically what they did was the Indians put their weapons in this hole. Then they got a live horse. You heard that right. Uh, some accounts say a white horse, but in any event, it was a live horse and put the horse in the hole with all the weapons. And then uh, the four chiefs and Captain Urudia joined hands and they danced three times around the hole. Now, I don't know if this meant that they were all in a big circle around it and kind of went around, or if they just held hands and danced around the hole, but in any event, that's what happened. They danced around this live horse, who no doubt was getting a little curious about his predicament, and all the weapons. Uh, then the Indians did the same with the priests and the citizens of San Antonio. So everybody got together and danced around uh, the hole containing the weapons and the horse. When this was done, everybody went back to the lines they had formed before, and then a signal was given, and everybody ran up to the hole and grabbed either a shovel or used their hands and buried the weapons and the horse, which signified the end of hostilities. The Indians uh, shouted their great war whoops. The Spanish gave three cheers of Viva el Rey, long live the king. Celebrations uh, finally came to a conclusion and the Indians left the next day on August the 20th, everyone agreeing that uh, the Indians were welcome in San Antonio any time and that everybody would get along forevermore. I have looked and I cannot find any account anywhere of any ceremony quite like the one held in San Antonio in 1749. Instead of the regular segment of getting there, I'm just going to tell you, go to the main plaza of San Antonio, Texas. There's a plaque in the main plaza commemorating the event. And as you stand there and read that plaque, remember that beneath your feet lie the 269-year-old bones of a white horse and a pile of war clubs, bows, arrows, and lances as well as the history of Apache conflicts in San Antonio. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. 
I hope you'll go to iTunes and leave a review if you like the show. Better yet, tell three friends about the show sometime this week. We're on social media. There's a Wise About Texas Facebook page. You can find the show on Instagram and Twitter at Wise About Texas. And if you want to support the promotion and preservation of Texas history, go to patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. Thanks for listening to the show today. Go out and do something for Texas. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.